Welcome everyone. My name is Jose Francisco, Project Manager at the IAS USA. Today's webinar will be going over fighting a moving target, SARS-CoV-2 variants and viral escape. I'd like to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Jonathan Lee from Harvard Medical School. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you very much, Jose. I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, just a, a couple of um, housekeeping uh, slides here. So first, um, this uh, presentation is uh, available for 1.25 AMA Category 1 credits. Uh, this course has also been approved for um, ABIM, CME, and, and other credits as well. Here are the uh, uh, contributors for the IAS USA um, webinar. There will be a few points during the presentation when um, I'll be asking questions, um, both at the beginning, the end, and at a couple points in the middle. Um, at that point, a separate window will pop up that will show the poll question. Uh, once you choose your response to the poll question, uh, then the, um, uh, the, uh, the percentages will be displayed after the poll closes. For some of the pretest, uh, questions, uh, we will go th over the answers at the end of the uh, webinar. And also, if you have questions, please submit your questions in the Q&A button. Uh, and please add your name as well. And I will try to get to as many questions as I can at the end of the webinar. So I am thrilled a bit today to be talking to you all about fighting a moving target, SARS-CoV-2 variants. And uh, viral escape. So I've got three overall overarching learning objectives, um, outlining the spread of novel variants of SARS-CoV-2, describing how SARS-CoV-2 variants may have arisen, and then defining the effects of the variants on therapies and vaccines. So let's start off questions. Again, um, the question, the first question is, which of the following is true about SARS-CoV-2 viral evolution? Is it one, the spread of new viral lineages is always slow and gradual. Two, rapid global spread has led to a greater viral diversity in SARS-CoV-2 than that with influenza. Is it the mutations in SARS-CoV-2 DNA genome can lead to key changes in the spike protein? Or is it the last one, an example of a more transmissible variant is the D614G variant. Please select your answer now. I'll be going over the answers. Actually, we'll be taking the same question at this uh, pretest um, at the end of the webinar as a post test. And then I'll go over the answers um, at that point. Okay, interesting. Interesting. All right, let's go to the second question. Five members of a family. Uh, recently returned from a trip to England, are all found to be infected with the B117 variant of SARS-CoV-2. Which of the following is true? Is it B117 increases transmission risk through higher levels but shorter duration of viral shedding? Is it that B117 decreases the risk of severe disease? Is it bamlanivimab should be effective if given to members of this family? Or is it that neutralizing antibody titers from the Moderna vaccinated sera have an approximately six-fold decreased efficacy against this variant? Please vote. All right, excellent. Oh, it's gonna be a good webinar, excellent. All right, so let's um, move on to, where's my, here we go. All right, so here's my overall um, overview of the presentation. I'm gonna start off by giving an update on COVID-19 numbers in worldwide and also um, in the US. We'll talk about the rise of the novel SARS-CoV-2 uh, variants, especially there's three that I'm gonna focus on. The B117, which started in the UK, the B1351, which uh, arose in South Africa and P1, which was first identified in Brazil. We'll talk about why we are worried about these variants, including evidence for increased risk of transmission, reinfections and poor outcomes, 
talk a little bit about how these variants could have arisen, the effect of novel variants on therapies and vaccines, and then are there any quote unquote homegrown US variants that um, we should be concerned about as well. So COVID-19 trends worldwide, we are at the point uh, of the epidemic where we've got 120 million cases and two and a half million deaths already. This particular figure uh, shows the number of daily cases per 100,000 uh, in the past week. And you can see that the pandemic is still raging out of control in multiple parts of the world, including in Europe, in South America, and even um, in some parts of the US um, as well. And if you look within the US, again, this is showing you the average daily cases per 100,000 in just the last week. And in the US in total now, we have 30 million cases and over half a million deaths. And you can still see that there are still a number of hotspots in the Midwest, some on the East Coast and in the South as well. But overall, the numbers in the US are improving, both for the number of cases on the left as well as hospitalizations uh, on the right. But having said that, there does appear to be some dark clouds uh, on the horizon. And the news about some of these novel variants have cast a bit of a shadow. And you may have seen some of these news reports, including ones about the B117 variant from the UK, the B1351 from South Africa, <clears throat> and then the P1 variant um, from Brazil. So let's, let's talk about um, uh, some of these variants. But um, the first thing to know is that all viruses will evolve over time. And that every time a virus mutates, mutations can occur. So on the left, uh, you've got your SARS-CoV-2, which has an RNA genome, by the way, not a DNA genome, but an RNA genome. Um, and it can produce this protein, this knobby protein on the outside called the spike protein. And it's a spike protein that interacts with the host receptors, the ACE2 receptor, as well as the area where a lot of the neutralizing antibodies will bind to. Now, as I mentioned, every time the virus replicates, there is a chance that it'll introduce an error. Now, if that error or that mutation occurs in the spike gene, it may change the appearance or the conformation of the spike protein, as you see on the, on the right-hand side. And it's important to realize that, you know, oftentimes these mutations are not good for the virus. They're deleterious for the virus. But sometimes it can luck into a mutation that can benefit um, you know, uh, the virus in terms of how it's transmitting, how quickly it's transmitting, or whether it's able to escape from the immune response. Now, how quickly does SARS-CoV-2 mutate compared to other viruses? And actually, SARS-CoV-2 mutation rate is actually a bit slower than uh, some of the other viruses that we're used to, uh, including in respiratory viruses like influenza. And that's because the, there's an enzyme that SARS-CoV-2 uses for replicating its RNA genome, and that's called the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And this particular enzyme actually has a proof reading function such that it actually can decrease and prevent mutations from arising. So overall, the, the frequency of mutations is actually lower in SARS-CoV-2 than in influenza. And if we wanna get a sense of the overall diversity of the um, epidemic, uh, SARS-CoV-2, compared to the other kind of common viruses that, that we think about, then we have to look at the phylogenetic tree. So what I'm showing you right now is a phylogenetic tree of all of the HIV envelope sequences that have been uploaded last year in 2020. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with these trees, the longer the branches the more diverse, the more mutations there are and the more diverse the sequences are. So this is all of the HIV kind of envelope sequences and what the phylogenetic tree looks like. This is um, an HIV proviral sequences, a phylogenetic tree made from the proviral sequences from one patient uh, who was actually sequenced in, in my lab. And you can, and, um, you can see that the, the genetic diversity within a single patient is far less than what you see in, in, you know, in the global diversity for, for HIV in 2020. Um, here is the global diversity of influenza. And you can see it's far smaller than, than HIV as, as we might expect. 
And this is, by the way, the, um, uh, the H1N1 influenza hemagglutinin, which is also on the outside, um, kind of the envelope. And then here's SARS-CoV-2. And I don't know if you can see that, that little smudge that's right down the bottom. You have to do a 10x magnification in order to see that the diversity of SARS-CoV-2 is actually far less than other common viruses that we're used to, including HIV, and even compared to other respiratory viruses like influenza. Um, but you know, having said that, new variants have emerged previously. And you may recall that last spring, uh, news emerged that there was a new mutation that was detected within the spike gene that was taking over the viral population, right? This is this D614G. And what that stands for is that at the 614th amino acid of the spike protein, there was a change from D to G, which is asparagine to glycine. And you can see that in the blue here, where um, starting late winter, early spring, the D614G variant really started spreading pretty wildly, you know, uh, and um, uh, started taking over as the predominant population concurrently in multiple parts of the world and multiple continents. And when this virus was characterized, it was found that this particular mutation, the D614G, gave the virus a uh, kind of a, a benefit in that it was more efficient at replicating, potentially uh, appears by potentially improving the way it binds to the host ACE2 uh, target receptor of the host cell so that it, it was able to bind and enter host cells more efficiently. And so thus leading to more efficient uh, replication and transmission. So again, new variants, mutations in SARS-CoV-2 is not necessarily new, all right? And then this is data from the United Kingdom uh, of all the variants that were present in the community in the last year. Each color shows a different variant present throughout 2020. And you can see that this pandemic has always comprised of a collection of different variants. So why are we concerned now? Well, first of all, you can see that starting in December, there was a rapid rise in B117. And this rise in the B117 when, at the end of 2020 was concurrent with a rapid rise in uh, cases in the UK. And this is despite the UK kind of locking down and, and trying to halt spread. So th the concern was that this particular, some particular variant appeared to be able to spread more easily. And that was borne out when, you, when they actually did sequencing studies and studies looking at which variants were actually um, increasing. So here is the trajectory of B117 spread in the UK. Um, on the right here, and you can see that the dark purple represents the proportion of the, um, the, you know, the variants that were B117. And you can see that over time, um, this B117 variant became the dominant species pretty much in all different areas of the UK, all generally around the same time. Um, I, I just wanted to mention one thing that you can see that the dark purple here is labeled as SGTF. And you might be wondering what SGTF means. Well, um, each time, you know, each of these qPCR tests for COVID um, uses um, this kind of qPCR method where you're, when you're amplifying little pieces of the genes for uh, SARS-CoV-2, and they, and they actually amplify several different pieces in different parts of the genome. B117 contains a mutation, actually a deletion, such that one of the gene uh, uh, primer pairs, this S gene primer pair doesn't work because of the deletion. Now, luckily, the other primer pairs do work. So you can, we can still diagnose these individuals with SARS-CoV-2, but the fact that the S gene target doesn't work, um, actually allows us to use a regular COVID testing to look for these S gene target failures or SGTFs as a proxy for the spread of B117. So when you see the word, you know, see the, the letters SGTF, just remember that is the same as a B117 because it's the S gene target failures or, or S negative um, sequences. 
So at this point um, on the left here, you can see that um, B117 now represents nearly all of the infections uh, in the UK. And on the right, there's some mathematical modeling um, of the transmission and the spread in the US. And there are some estimates that it may lead to half of all US infections by either the end of the month or even early April. And then eventually it might end up becoming the dominant species um, in the US uh, as well. So around the same time as the B117 was coming out from uh, England, there was a surge in South Africa as well. And you can see that, that this rapid increase was seen again in, in multiple different regions of South Africa all around the same time. This figure shows the rapid rise of this variant B1351 in South Africa. All of the different colors here, again, represents a different variant. And the white represents kind of the, you know, the, the spread, the, the, the rest of the variants that aren't shown in the colors. But you can see that um, starting in November and December, this B1351 variant really quickly became um, the dominant uh, variant in, in uh, South Africa. And then finally, all, you know, around the same time, end of last year in the winter, earlier this year, a new variant arose from Brazil called the P1 variant. Um, this P1 variant especially uh, began kind of decimating the city of Manaus, which had been hit hard by a first wave last spring. And at that time, last spring, summer, there was some hope that that city of Manaus had actually reached herd immunity. But unfortunately, that was not the case. And um, P1 actually <laughs> came to really dominate um, the infection and, and the uh, outbreak in, in Manaus. All right, so we've talked a little bit about the COVID numbers. We've talked a little bit about, you know, introduce these, these new variants. Um, now let's go through why we're worried. Um, you know, the evidence for, for, for increased risk of transmission reinfection outcomes and where could these variants have come from? So, but before I start, I want to go to our first audience response question. So, what do you guys think? What do you think right now are the important reasons that the new variants are able to spread so quickly? Do you think it's because they are, um, they result in higher rates of viral shedding? Is it because they have more prolonged viral shedding? Is it from reinfections of previously infected individuals or is it all of the above, please vote. Ah, all of the above, excellent. All right, let's take a look at the data. All right, so the first um, question is, how much more transmissible do we think B117 is? All right, so, this data comes from Public Health England. It's a lot of numbers, but I am going to um, walk you, whoops, I'm going to walk you through it right now. And um, okay, so this first box here is um, our individuals who are infected with B117. The second box area here represents those who are infected with, with non-B117. What I'm showing, the numbers here represent secondary attack rates, which means if you've got an infected patient, what are the chances they will infect someone you know, around them, right? And <clears throat> what you'll see is that overall, the secondary attack rate of 14.7% for a B117 variant is about you know, 40, 50% higher than that of a non-B117 variant here, 11%. But that if you try to look at it, um, across different regions of England, across the different intensities of contact, across different age groups, you'll see that this trend of about a 50% higher risk is really um, you know, remarkably consistent across all of these different strata, that no matter how you cut the data, it appears that B117 has an increased risk and potentially somewhere around a 50% increased risk of a secondary attack rate or, or having one of your contacts become uh, infected. Now, why is it that um, the B117 variant or some of these other variants may be more transmissible? 
Well, I'm showing you two different studies, uh, one from the UK on the left and one from South Africa <clears throat> on the right. And it's showing the same thing, that um, these new variants lead to higher levels of viral shedding. Now, the y-axis here is CT values, okay? Just think of CT values as like viral loads, but the opposite. So the lower the CT value, the higher the viral load, okay? So on, for the UK uh, variant, you can see that you've got these S gene, S negatives, or the same thing as the SGETFs, S gene target failures. So those are the B117s. And you can see that the B117 infected patients had lower CT values. Um, and, and so representing higher levels of viral shedding when they were diagnosed. And the same thing with the B1351 variant in South Africa, which is shown here in yellow in a, in a slightly different name, but it's the B1351. So appears these individuals who are infected with the new variants appeared to have um, higher levels of viral shedding. Now, we've also learned uh, a lot about the variants and how they transmit through the MBA. So you might think, what does the MBA have to teach us about variants and shedding? Well, last year they performed really intensive daily surveillance testing of their players and employees and have been able to capture uh, seven individuals who are infected with the B117. And I'm showing you, uh, you can see the viral loads here on the kind of the upper left here for each of the individuals with those who were infected with B117 in the red lines and those who are infected with non-B117 in the blue. The bottom left is um, kind of the mean for each of the different groups. <clears throat> and you can see here, first of all, there are two things. One, that the B117 infected individuals in red did have higher peaks, maybe a median of about twofold higher peaks, but that the biggest difference was actually a longer period of infectiousness, right? You can see that between the peaks, that um, the, the amount of time between the peaks and with viremia was longer for the red line for the B117 infected individuals than for the non-B117 infected individuals. And that data is also reflected on the, um, on the figure shows the distribution of the duration of viral shedding. And what you can see is that the mean duration of infection and shedding was eight days for the non-B117 infections in the blue and 13 days for the B117 infection. So not only do the B117 um, variant have higher levels of shedding, but they're shedding for a much longer period of time. So it means that more greater chance of infecting someone else. <clears throat> Another reason that new variants may be spreading is that they can cause reinfections. So this is data from the placebo arm of the Novavax vaccine trial in South Africa. So the vaccine was tested right when the B1351 variant was becoming the dominant strain you can see at the top here. <clears throat> and the vast majority of individuals were infected with, the, with this uh, B1351 variant. Now on the bottom, you can see the infection rates of those who entered the trial uh, as someone who has previously been infected. Those are the seropositive individuals in the darker line versus those who are seronegative um, in the dotted line. And you can see that whether someone uh, that whether someone had a previous infection really didn't have a lot of protective effect on whether they could be reinfected with the new variant. Now, having said that, this is from a preprint that they put up um, not too long ago, but just a few days ago, they released another um, you know, kind of news uh, um, report here. Uh, press release, I guess is what you call it, um, saying that they've got some additional data. Um, and there's, you can see that there's a red line here on the bottom where I just highlighted um, the, the part that I wanted to just to, to, to show here, where they said that with some additional data, they found that um, the, at 90 days, the illness rate was about 8% in the baseline seronegative individuals uh, and 4.5% at the baseline uh, seropositive um, participants. So if you're seropositive, it means that you've been infected before, there does appear to be maybe a little bit of a, of a protective um, effect, but still a lot of um, individuals who were previously infected appear to be able to be um, reinfected with the, with the new variant here. And that actually is concurrent 
with a lot of the data from the convalescent plasma studies, where if you take convalescent plasma from individuals who were infected last spring and you try to neutralize the B1351, frequently it didn't work at all. Um, and um, of course, just as worrying, worrisome is that uh, B117 has been associated with increased mortality. And this is data from a study, a kind of a case control study from England. They're taking 55,000 patients with B117 versus 55,000 without, and they match them up with age, <clears throat> ethnicity, um, uh, gender. And you can see that the B117 individuals uh, which are, again here is the S gene negative, right? So that's the B117 is in yellow, um, did appear to have lower survival probability compared to those um, who had the non B117. All right, so what's going on in the US right now? On the left is B117. You can see that B117 is now um, detectable in pretty much every single state um, and including uh, more than hundred cases in, in many states. And then there are the B1351 and the P1 variants are also a little bit more slowly, but also spreading um, in the US um, as well. So where could these variants um, have come from? So again, I'm showing you a phylogenetic tree. And in this tree, I've thrown in the B117 and the B1351 variants uh, with some representative sequences um, kind of up to that point. And what you notice here with the B117 is that there, there is this long branch before all of these sequences become detectable, right? And it's, um, it appears that these, this thing came, the B117 popped up relatively suddenly, right? And without, you know, these intermediate branches, you know, that you might be expecting to see kind of as a evolutionary intermediate, rather than just having it pop up so suddenly with such a long branch and, and um, with all of these mutations already in place. You would expect there's some you know, form of the virus that's present that has maybe half of the mutations or a fourth or three quarters, and then it slowly gains it over time. But that's not, that wasn't the case here. Um, another way to look at it is by plotting out the number of new mutations in each sequence over time. All right, so the, the x-axis here is time. The y-axis is the number of new mutations that are being accumulated. And you can see that mostly there's a nice straight line that, um, uh, at, you know, which represents the rate at which the virus is mutating and evolving over time. But then you take a look at the B117, B1351, and P1 variants, and they jump off of that line, right? They're way on top of that line. And so it's these kind of evolutionary jumps that you can see through both the phylogenetic tree and through this, this second graph that suggests the presence of some hidden source of viral evolution in the community. So wh where is this hidden source of viral evolution? Well, I'm gonna give you two possibilities here, right? So one possibility is that the virus is evolving undetected because of a combination of high rates of infection and uncontrolled infection and also uneven sequence surveillance. So this table was from a couple months ago, but I think it, it makes an important point. Um, at first, it shows the number of cases within each country, the number of sequences that have been, been sequenced, and also the percent of the cases that have been sequenced by country. And it shows that with relatively few exceptions, much of the world, including the US, has not placed viral sequencing as a priority up until Recently, I mean, the U.S. wasn't even in the top 40 in terms of the number, you know, number of sequences per per case load. And what's it's quite possible that a variant like B117 arose over time in a region of the world where there hasn't been a lot of sequencing coverage, and then it's all of a sudden seeded the pandemic in the U.K. Now you'll notice that Britain is in the top 10 in sequencing, and so I, I don't think it's necessarily a coincidence that the alarm over new variants really started in, in England. Um, and that um, it really highlights the fact that um, we're not gonna find these variants unless we look for them. And that um, you know, potentially we might have some sequencing blind spots out there where viruses are changing, but we just don't detect it, right? Now, the sudden appearance of some of these variants has also reminded me of a case that we published last year 
of an immunosuppressed individual um, at our hospital with evidence of persistent COVID and accelerated viral evolution. So last summer I was contacted um, by the clinical team about this patient who was heavily immunosuppressed and admitted for a second episode of uh, COVID-19. And the question to, to us at the time was whether this was a case of a COVID reinfection or whether the immunosuppressive agents this patient was on was causing him to have persistent infection. And over the subsequent five months, this patient required several readmissions with high levels of intermittent viral loads. You can see that here in red from the nasopharyngeal swabs. Now, the viral load got as high as about nine logs um, about five months after the initial diagnosis. And so we looked at the viruses to look for evidence of persistent infection or reinfection, see whether there are signs of viral evolution and viral escape, and also determine whether or not this virus is infectious. And um, this patient, um, we were able to obtain the virus or the samples from this individual over the course of the five months, and we perform viral sequencing. And this, again, is the phylogenetic tree. And what it shows pretty definitively is that there is um, not reinfection, but that there is evidence of persistent infection. And all, the arrow and, and the dark red here shows all of the sequences that were generated from this individual over the course of those five months. And what you can see is that they're all branching from the same root, from the same ancestor, and they're just branching outwards. And that's a sign of kind of viral evolution <clears throat> and viral persistence. Now, you might be asking, well, how, do, how would reinfection look like? And how, how do we differentiate between reinfection and persistent infection? And I'm just gonna show you here on the left, again, it's the same phylogenetic tree, I just you know, put in a, few, uh, a little bit less labeling, but the same sequences on the left. On the right, was actually one of the first reinfection cases that was described of a, of a young man from Nevada. And you can see here that the first sequence is actually here in the, in the bottom left. And the second sequence is all the way up here in the top right. Again, this is a circular. Where everything comes from the same, uh, comes from the same um, ancestor. In addition, we found that the persisting virus is in fact infectious. We were able to collaborate with some colleagues um, in a, uh, the local biosafety level three uh, facility. Um, the top left here um, shows a, um, a nice kind of single layer of cells called the Vero E6 cells. On the right is a positive control where you add in virus and you can see that the cells have been disrupted by evidence of cytopathic effect where the cells, a lot of the cells have died because of viral infection. So that's the positive control. The bottom two are um, what happened when, when um, samples from this patient was added to this culture. And you can see that there is evidence of viral infection of the culture um, out to five months after the initial uh, infection. In addition, um, the, some of the hallmark mutations of the novel variants uh, really also arose in this patient. And um, here at the top, I'm showing you the SARS-CoV-2 genome. The um, red are the synonymous mutations. The blue are the non-synonymous mutations. And the, the black here are the, are the deletions. Now, non-synonymous mutations are the mutations that cause amino acid changes. And what you can see is that the mutations in this patient are not randomly distributed across the genome, but instead are focused in a few specific areas, specifically the spike gene, which makes up about 13% of the genome, but about half of all the amino acid mutations found in this patient. In addition, within the spike gene, there is a receptor binding domain where it binds to the ACE2 receptor to get into the host cell. That RBD section comprises only 2% of the genome, but really a third of all the amino acid changes were here. In addition, during the course of this patient's illness, he developed a couple of hallmark mutations. For example, on the right, you see is something called 501Y. 501Y is the hallmark mutation for B117. And then 484, position 44, there's a K. 
And that is one of the hallmark mutations for the, both the South African and the P1 uh, Brazilian variant as well. And so you can see that in this individual didn't have these mutations when he first became ill, but that he developed these mutations over time. And that's really an example of viral evolution kind of in real time here. Now, could, well, first of all, I would say that we have no, there's no evidence that our patient transmitted the variants you know, to anyone else. But overall, you know, could um, the variants have originated during um, persistent COVID from a similar patient? Well, there's been a number of published cases now of persistent COVID. And while we don't have, I would say, definitive proof, um, I just want to show that a, a phylogenetic tree where you have the, the new variants and the persistent COVID patients together, and you can see that evolution within a, a, a particular host um, from usually an immunosuppressed individual um, could have led to um, a new variant that could then have spread out to the community, right? So it's possible that a lot of the missing evolution, say in B117, could have happened in the immunosuppressed host and then before it jumped to the general population. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention that in looking at a lot of these um, persistent COVID cases, it does seem like uh, the majority of individuals with persistent COVID appears to have a B cell immunodeficiency. Not all of them, but that does seem to be another hallmark of, um, of persistent COVID. All right, so we've talked about, again, now we're talking about why we're worried, talking about how these cases might have, have arisen. Let's go to our last section, which is the effect of novel variants on therapies and vaccines. And are there any homegrown US variants that we should be concerned about? So that brings us to our second audience response survey. How will the new variants affect monoclonal antibodies? Will the new variants uh, decrease the efficacy of all antibody treatments? Will novel variants decrease only the efficacy of single antibody treatments? Or does it depend on the variant and the monoclonal antibody treatments? Please vote now. Ah, you guys are too smart already. All right, so let's go through some of the data. All right, so first part, how do these variants affect efficacy of monoclonal antibody treatment? So a little bit of background on these, um, these MABs, these monoclonal antibodies. So they're, they're um, in, engineered humanized antibodies and they're, they've been shown to be efficacious for, for a number of viral infections, including um, for COVID-19. The first monoclonal antibody was palavizumab, developed in 1988 to treat RSV. For COVID, monoclonal antibodies have been developed to bind the spike protein to prevent ACE2 um, binding. You can see that in that little figure on the right here. There are two monoclonal antibody therapies with FDA emergency, emergency use authorization. There's the Lilly, um, either bamlanivimab alone or in combination with etisevimab. And then you've got the combination of the two Regeneron antibodies, the Kesarivimab and Imdevimab. So, so Bamlanivimab was the first um, to be EUA um, approved. Um, and a recent study in JAMA um, actually showed that combination treatment, uh, this is now the phase two uh, study of the combination treatment, um, Bamlanivimab and Etisevimab together had greater potency in terms of viral decay um, as you can see in the blue curve for the combination treatment. Um, in addition, like antiviral therapy for HIV, it's hoped that combination therapy will extend treatment to more variants and also prevent viral escape. So on the right, you see that the rates of emerging resistance is lower in the combination arm um, than in the single treatment arms. Now, there were several trials that were presented at CROI that I wanna go over very, very briefly. The first is the BLAZE-1 phase three study of bamlanivimab and etosevimab in uh, this, uh, 500 patients in each group. Now I've listed out their main finding here, which is a 70% reduction in hospitalization or death, 7% versus 2%. Uh, and all, in addition, uh, there were actually 10 deaths in the placebo arm and none in the bamlanivimab etosevimab arm, which is phenomenal. And on the right is the um, 
the Kaplan-Meier curve, which shows the same result. So based on this data, um, Lilly has received FDA EUA authorization for their combination treatment, although this particular study has not yet been published. Now, there's also been a couple other pieces of good news that was presented at CROI just a week ago. On the left is data from BLAZE2 showing that bamlanivimab was able to protect nursing home residents during an outbreak with an 80% reduction in risk of symptomatic disease, which is fantastic. And on the right, the Regeneron monoclonal antibodies were able to protect household contacts while 100% prevention of symptomatic infection or of high viral load infection um, and 50% reduction in infection overall, including asymptomatic uh, infection. So overall, some really good news from, uh, from the recent CROI uh, conference. Although there was a whole answer and discuss, you know, discussion section, answer Q&A section, and there's a lot of questions about variants, but there was no answers really there. Uh, and there was no data that was presented on the impact of variants uh, on these clinical trial results. So let's go through the data that's, that is available. So the first thing that I wanted to, to make clear is that variants, people like to lump all of them in together, but they're not created equal. And monoclonal antibodies are not created equal. So if you look at um, B117, for example, even though it spreads very rapidly, we're very worried about it, potentially has high transmission, high, um, higher mortality rate, it actually doesn't include any resistance mutations against any of the monoclonal antibodies. On the other hand, B1351 uh, and P1 uh, include the E44K and K417 mutations that causes resistance against bamlanivimab, etisevimab, as well as kesarivimab, right? Now, imdevimab, luckily, is not affected, so you would assume that the Regeneron antibody combination should still be active against um, all of these variants. And in fact, some of the in vitro data does seem to support that, that um, if you look at the, the UK variant, the, the B117 uh, on the bottom again, all of the different antibody combinations are active against B117. But the South African B1351 variant, you can see that um, uh, either singly or in combination, those little the B1351 uh, variant, whereas the, the uh, combination of the, the Regeneron uh, antibodies um, do maintain activity as, as we had predicted in the last uh, in the last slide. Now the D614G, by the way, is just the wild type because, uh, you know, as 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 I mentioned, uh, pretty much every single variant has D614G at this point. So what makes B1351 more difficult to neutralize? Uh, well, here's a visual representation of the spike gene and the key mutations in in uh, present in B1351. You'll see that. Um, K44 and, and N417, they're, you know, they're all uh, at the outer surface of the spike. And then you've got 501Y, which is here as well. There's also some mutations in the N-terminal domain, which probably also play a role in viral escape as well. But um, you know, amongst these mutations I mentioned include uh, E44 and, um, K, uh, and 417. Uh, and um, you can see that they are located at the interspace between the spike and then the antibodies, right? And that's exactly why um, they're able to um, mutate and escape from these antibody uh, binding. Uh, now, uh, on the other hand, you know, if you look at the Regeneron monoclonal antibodies, uh, unlike the Lily ones, there's actually fewer kind of overlapping escape sites, and it's um, uh, it you know luckily um, some of these mutations don't affect um, at least one of the two Regeneron antibodies. And you can see here the in bold you've got so you've got your two um, Regeneron antibodies uh, in the middle, and, and I guess the, this box right here in the middle. Um, the bold uh, areas or um, numbers are mutations of concern for the two Regeneron antibodies. Uh, but luckily, if you look at it, there's actually not as much overlap between these so that if you look at any single mutation, they're generally um, still efficacious against single mutations. And luckily, um, Devimab um, is, is um, not affected by either 44K or the um, 417 mutation. Now, on the other hand, 
uh, viral escape to the Regeneron antibody can happen, actually. I want to bring our story back to our immunosuppressed patient. He did receive the Regeneron monoclonal antibody combination with subsequent declines in viral load. Um, we looked for evidence of the um, potential Regeneron resistance mutation emergence. We partnered with a collaborator out at the University of Washington who had mapped a whole constellation of potential antibody escape variants. And using our kind of our deep sequencing, we were able to show that, that um, despite the initial drop in viral load after Regeneron monoclonal antibody treatment, there was a rapid rise in some of these mutations in blue that together conferred resistance, um, actually have, there's resistance uh, uh, present for both of these Regeneron antibodies. So this is also consistent with some reports out from convalescent plasma treatment in immunosuppressed individuals showing that emergence of escape mutations uh, can occur. And I think that the, one of the reasons that emergence of resistance may occur you know, potentially more commonly in immunosuppressed individuals is that in those with persistent COVID, they likely just have a di more diverse range of mutations given how long the virus has been replicating at baseline. And that could have lowered the barrier to emergence of a, of a novel uh, viral escape. All right, so let's talk about, you know, what about vaccine efficacy, <clears throat> all right? So I'm gonna go back to the same theme as the monoclonal antibodies, right? That not all variants are created equal. So um, here I'm showing you data from the Moderna vaccine showing that the, um, on the left here, you'll see that um, compared to the wild type, quote unquote, wild type um, D614G, the B117 variant really doesn't have much resistance against, against the vaccines. So it neutralizes the vaccine, just uh, neutralizes B117, the vaccine, uh, vaccinated serum neutralizes B117 just as well as it does to um, the wild type D614G that's circulating. It's actually B1351, right? Which we had talked about was the bad actor when it came to monoclonal antibodies. Again, it's going to cause a little bit of problems when it comes to vaccines as well because of the, some of these same mutations that we talked about, the, the 484 and the 417. And for Moderna, at least, it causes about a six-fold decrease in neutralization titers. Now, it, it may sound not great, but actually even a six-fold decrease in titers, you still get very high titers, even at that level. So the, the, um, we, we believe that, that the Moderna vaccine and Pfizer and some of these other vaccines should still give you excellent protection, even against the B1351, especially against severe disease. And that actually has been borne out in um, some other studies. And, and, and I want to just go over the, the other fact that, well, remember how I said that not all monoclonal antibodies were the same? Well, here, not all vaccines are the same as well. So on the left, I'm showing you some data from the FDA application document for the J&J &J vaccine, because that's not been published either. So it shows you the efficacy of the J&J &J vaccine compared to uh, for moderate severe disease and also just for severe disease. And for patients in the US, as well as for patients in South Africa. Now, most of the South African patients were infected with B1351. And so you can see that the effect um, uh, efficacy of the vaccine is a little bit lower in the South African patients, but the vaccine was still excellent, right? Especially for severe disease. And it still maintained high levels of, of efficacy. And I think the same thing is, is likely to happen probably with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines as well. On the other hand, the AstraZeneca vaccine didn't fare nearly as well. Um, in a previous kind of pooled analysis when they're looking at um, non-variant infections, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine had probably a 70% um, efficacy and actually had excellent efficacy against B117, right? As you would expect, given all that I've shown you. This is data on the right from their phase two trial in South Africa. They enrolled 2,000 patients. They found that vaccine efficacy was, oh, and uh, actually, by the way, the data here is showing you all patients. So placebo um, in red and uh, vaccinated in, in the um, blue and the cumulative event rate of, of, uh, of diagnosis. And um, what they found was that vaccine efficacy against non-B1351 variants was 70, 75%, so similar to what they found previously. But over the course of this trial, you know, um, especially towards the end, 
most patients became infected with D1351. And that's why you can, I think you can see that the curve started to try to, 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 try to separate and then they came back together here. Um, but they found that the vaccine efficacy was only about 10% against D1351 for preventing mild to moderate uh, COVID. So again, not all vaccines are the same, but I think the ones that are FDA approved for the US, you know, J&J, um, &J, Pfizer, Moderna, I think they still have excellent efficacy, even against the hard to neutralize variants like D1351. In addition, booster shots are on the way. This is just from last week from Moderna. And I've, I've um, put a red underline uh, in the bottom in the area that of interest in which they are doing an add-on study to their phase prior phase two study, where they're taking 60 individuals who were previously vaccinated and giving them boosters of um, either their mRNA vaccine that's been uh, modified to include the B1351 variant or a multivalent vaccine where it includes both the original mRNA, but also the B1351 variant. So booster shots may be on the way. We'll have to see how it looks. Um, now, the final um, topic I wanna talk about is, are there any known variants in the US that we should be concerned about? And the answer is yes. So far, there are two that we should that we are concerned about. Uh, on the left is um, is from California. There's a variant called B1427 and 429, and on the right is uh, a B1526 from uh, New York. So uh, the California B1427 429 has now pretty much become the dominant variant. Um, out on the, the West Coast. Uh, in New York City, B1526, um, over just the last couple months, now has makes up about 40% of all the variants in New York City. And if we look at, you know, what is the effect of these new variants against the monoclonal antibodies, you'll see that B1427, 429 contains a um, mutation called L454. 2R, and that this decreases the efficacy of bamlanivimab. And B1526 from New York contains E44K, which we've heard about, right, from the, uh, from the South African and Brazilian variants, and, and that will decrease efficacy of bamlanivimab and kesarubimab. Now, if you look, if you try the, to use the combination, um, I think either combination active against um, uh, each of these two uh, variants. But the fact that the B1427 and B1429 variants have become the dominant variants in California and that that variant contains a resistance mutation against bamlanivimab has led to this update from um, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. And it's in this box here. And it talks about how um, because of the uh, circulation of this new California variant, um, that they will limit the distribution to these regions, specifically California, Arizona, and Nevada of BAM-lenivimab while evaluations are ongoing. So there's already been some implications of these variants for which monoclonal antibodies should be used um, in the US. All right, so just to summarize here, key points number one, there are several variants of concern that have spread rapidly, right? Uh, new variants may be more transmissible because of higher levels of viral shedding, more prolonged shedding, uh, and also causes reinfections. New variants may be more likely to cause severe disease. That the sudden emergence of novel SARS-CoV-2 variants with a large set of mutations suggests a hidden source of viral evolution in the community. It may well kind of highlight the need to ramp up our viral sequencing efforts because we might have blind spots out there, but also that immunosuppressed individuals, especially those with B-cell immunosuppression, may have persistent COVID and accelerated viral evolution with monoclonal antibody resistance. That novel variants, especially the B1351 and the P1, may decrease the effectiveness of some current monoclonal antibody treatments and vaccines, and, but it depends on the variant and it depends on the vaccine, right? But that the current FDA approved vaccine remains efficacious. Um, and finally, the um, homegrown variants in the US also need to be monitored. 
Now, I, I know that everything that I've said may cause you a, a little bit of anxiety, but I want to leave with a more optimistic slide that if you look at the number of infections in all of these places with the new variants, they're going down everywhere, the US, the UK, South Africa. And what this really shows is that all of the public health interventions that we have advocated for and, and, uh, and, 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 and use, whether it's you know, masking, physical distancing, some limits on social gatherings, they all work. And, and now vaccines as well, I think maybe playing a role as well. So you know, the things that, that we know work against the old variants will work against the new variants. So there is a reason for optimism, all right? All right, so let's go back to our post-test question number one. Which of the following is true about SARS-CoV-2 viral evolution? Spread of new viral lineages is always slow and gradual. Rapid global spread has led to a greater diversity than that with influenza. Mutations in SARS-CoV-2 DNA genome can lead to key changes in the spike protein. Um, an example of a more transmissible variant is the D614G variant. So please vote again. All right, so my, my distractor has still got some of you. So the D614G variant uh, is an example of more transmissible variant. Uh, uh, I, this was, I, I was not playing totally fair, so I apologize for that. But um, SARS-CoV-2 actually does not have a DNA genome, has an RNA genome. You guys did get uh, most of that question, but it was a little bit unfair. I, I will admit that. So, but uh, all right, let's go to the second question. Just want to make sure you guys were paying attention. All right, post tech question number two. Five members of the family that recently returned from a trip to England are all found to be infected with the B117 variant of SARS-CoV-2. Which of the following is true? B117 increases transmission risk through higher levels, but shorter duration of viral shedding. B117 decreases the risk of severe disease. Family of the map should be effective if given to members of this family or neutralizing antibody titers from Moderna vaccine to serum have a six-fold decrease of efficacy against this variant, against B117 variant. Which of these is true? Please vote. Oh, this is great. You guys have, makes me feel really good. So excellent. So that's, so um, most of you, I think most of you voted for the first one the last time. And, uh, but now you know that uh, B117 increased transmission both through higher levels and longer duration of viral shedding, that it actually increases the risk of severe disease. Now, the last one, some of you still fell for my distractor. The last one, right? The neutralizing antibody titers from Moderna doesn't have a six fold decreased efficacy against B117, but actually against B1351. Remember, B117 is the one that is more transmissible, but doesn't affect monoclonal antibodies and doesn't affect vaccines, right? So whereas the B1351 is the bad actor, uh, and also P1, that affects um, both the vaccines and the monoclonal antibodies. So, but excellent, great. And um, I'm happy to take uh, questions in the next, uh, I think we've got 15 minutes or so where I can take questions and I see some questions, I'm gonna stop sharing. And I am going to open up the Q and A box here. Oh, the first one is why are there two different nomenclatures uh, for describe these variants? I don't know, all I can do is just, it's going to be this like face palm thing because even even the scientists like don't you know it's it's I, I will say that the, the main issue here is that these variants are changing very quickly and um, the one that at this point and and that multiple different groups originally had come up with different ways to name the variants but I think at this point most people have settled on this this pangolin um, scheme uh, or uh, you know a way of naming the variants. 
um, this group, this guy, Andrew Rambolt, um, and his group have come up with it. And I think it makes a lot of sense, but I, it's, it's a bit of a mystery to, to, to all of us as well, how these are, are named. But you know, the other thing too to know is that there's tons of variants out there, but not every variant gets a name, right? You have to be super special to get a name. And you really only get a name like B117, B1351, generally, if there's some reason for concern that there's there, it, 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 that it's leading to a distinct lineage and that potentially that lineage is, is leading to, um, um, to, to some potential issue. That's when we start thinking of these as variants of concern. Otherwise, you know, there's some that don't meet that criteria that are variants of interest, right? So, but anyway, it, it's, it's complicated now. I'll just leave it at that. So um, uh, if uh, B117, uh, for those in, infected with B1, P1 in Manaus, Brazil, was there a different course for the infection, a milder course reinfection? You know, it's not totally clear still, um, Keith, about that. Um, but um, if you look at the published literature on reinfections, it's pretty evenly split between individuals who are have more severe disease versus those who have less um, severe disease compared to the first infection. Now, if you look at what happened in Manaus though, I mean, their hospital system was overwhelmed and their death rate skyrocketed. So just based on these kind of overall general numbers in Manaus, it didn't necessarily appear that, that, that hospitalizations or death rates were really all that lower during the reinfection, which is a bit, which is a bit concerning. Um, yes, uh, if B117 results in longer shedding, what about the duration of isolation? That is a phenomenal question. And I think that is something that the CDC is probably grappling with right now, right? Because you've got viral shedding instead of eight days, you've got seven, you've got 13 days. Does that mean that the current recommendation of 10 days is insufficient? It may be. I, I think that um, I think that uh, it's it's I, I believe it's something that the CDC is looking at right now, but I, I think it is not unreasonable if you've got B117 and you know these days though we, we don't sequence enough for most people to know whether they have B117. It's probably not unreasonable for people with known B117 to just stay home a little bit longer. I think I think that's not unreasonable. So um, the next question um, is. Uh, the Kistler data showing longer culture or viral shedding. Therefore, can we really say that the longer shedding is longer infectiousness? So, you know, they didn't really have culture positive results. It's only RNA. But we know at this point that higher levels of viral RNA, especially above 10 to the fifth, 10 to the six logs, really almost directly equates to culture positivity. If you can maintain your viral load up to that level, 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, for a longer period of time, for several days longer, then you're going to be infectious for longer. But you're right, though, that that, that, that paper, that preprint about the NBA, um, did not include um, culture results. Uh, I think I've answered that. That's the next question. is also about longer du quarantine durations. I think I've answered that. That I think the, the CDC is looking at it, but we haven't, they have not changed their guidance um, yet. Um, all right, so next, uh, does environmental temperature affect the increased uh, spread of the virus, such as warmer, colder climate, summer versus winter? Man, that is, an, uh, so definitely, la so let's take a step back. We know that every, almost just about every single respiratory virus has a seasonality. Right, and that whether it's flu or parainfluenza or other viruses, almost all of them have a have a distinct seasonality. So I and it is thought that some of that is because in the winter we congregate together, um, but even in places that are relatively warm, like in the you know southern U.S. or Australia, you know there is a seasonality when it comes to these, and and, the, and I think that people think that it could have to do with colder temperatures because it's thought that. Um, well, first of all, viruses tend to last longer um, in ambient, in, in, in colder kind of ambient temperatures, and, and that could be a reason. Um, and it is true that last summer, we did have a bit of a lull. Um, how much of that is because of, you know, everyone went outdoors, how much of that is because of the temperature is hard to say. But I think that for me personally, I, I think that um, I am 
after all this, I am optimistic about our, this summer and about the fall and just because in a combination of the weather and combination of, of vaccines, I, I am, I am, I tend to be, be um, uh, I tend to be more optimistic. All right, can the increased mortality found with B117 variant be attributed to increased inoculum at exposure? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, dose of inoculation directly impacts disease progression and pathogenesis. That's a great question. I don't have an answer for you there. Um, it's really hard to measure dose, inoculation dose in, in humans. I, I think it's possible that if someone is more infectious, they're potentially transmitting more virus to the other person and that could be leading to more. It, it's, it's a plausible explanation, um, but um, I don't know. Um, B11 emerged through recombination. So we know that it's, it's been hard to know about B117 and, and or just any of these and recombination. Um, I will say that co-infections with two different strains of, of COVID have been relatively rare. Um, and also within host diversity, within each single person and, and someone who's not immunosuppressed, diversity is also pretty rare. So um, recombination events, I, I think at this point, we don't have really good data suggesting that recombination is a major driver of diversity, as opposed to say HIV, where recombination um, is an important one as well. Should we be prioritizing HIV positive uh, patients and other immunosuppressed patients? <sighs> yeah, so the CDC does prioritize some immunosuppressed individuals for vaccinations. Specifically, they put in there, um, at least uh, they, they have been up until recently, um, solid organ transplant um, individuals. Uh, and I've always thought that that was a bit too narrow of a definition, especially since, you know, I think B cell immunosuppressive patients are, I, I think are clearly at higher risk of persistent infection. Those who are receiving rituximab, for example, and other, you know, bone marrow transplantation and such. And so I really do think that those individuals should be prioritized. Um, and, you know, there is some evidence, the evidence for HIV is still a bit circumstantial, but data from South Africa does seem to show that those who have lower CD4 counts may do a little bit worse as well um, when it comes to COVID outcomes. So I think heavy, I think heavy immunosuppression to me makes sense to try to broaden that category a little bit and to, and to have them, um, um, uh, to treat them a little bit more aggressively, intensively with uh, monoclonal antibodies to, you know, kind of give them a little bit of a leg up when it comes to vaccines. That, that all makes a lot of sense to me, I have to say. Um, so next question is, um, given what you presented regarding uh, prolonged shedding uh, and emergence of new strains, would you suggest countries with high levels of HIV infection prioritize this population vaccine rollouts? That's a good question. Um, when it comes to prolonged shedding persistent infection, most of the reports are of B cell immunosuppression, right? So lymphomas, um, CLL, uh, rituximab treatment, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, other 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 things similar to that. Whereas HIV patients um, have predominantly a T cell immunosuppression. So the question of whether HIV patients patients with advanced HIV are at higher risk of persistent infection is still a little bit unclear. Although I will say that there's now been a couple of publication kind of case reports suggesting that uh, kind of, or reporting of um, a couple of patients with HIV, advanced HIV with maybe more prolonged disease. Uh, and then there's, of course, you know, one of these variants came about in South Africa where there's a, a, a sizable population of individuals with advanced HIV. I, I think the, I think, Again, the data is still a little bit unclear. Mostly B cells. B cell is definitely, I would say, a risk. Um, advanced HIV, still not a hundred percent clear about that. But um, uh, at this point, um, okay. Regarding patients with persistent infection, what are the implications for public health? Should we be testing infected patients for persistent anemia, sequencing virus? Ugh. I think this is another great question. Right now, if you look at the CDC criteria for letting someone out of isolation, right, it's ten days from symptom onset. And as long as their symptoms are getting better, they can leave isolation. But even the CDC will have a caveat for that, that all of this data is based off of immuno, 
you know, immunocompetent individuals and that there's very little data in immunosuppressed individuals. And I think to me that it makes sense that we should just be paying a lot more attention to these immunosuppressed patients and that um, it, you know, potentially by um, making sure that they do have a test of, you know, a test of cure in this case, um, to make sure that um, their shedding has, has, has waned over time. There's also been a report in the literature the publication in Cell of actually a patient with, who was immunosuppressed um, with asymptomatic shedding for about three months, high levels. So it does worry me. I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. It worries me. Um, please comment on new oral treatment to cure infection if given in the first few days of symptoms. Yeah, so there's a number of, you know, oral regimens that are still being, um, being tested in early phase trials. List a few of them. I mean, obviously people know about hydroxychloroquine. Recently studies on ivermectin, at least in more severe cases, don't seem to work as well. Um, fluvoxamine, um, I think, has potential. Um, there's a couple other um, oral agents being tested. There's a um, uh, something called Camostab, which is a protease inhibitor. Um, so I, I think that the data is still out. Um, there's some, I think, there's some promising, promising ones out there. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, given the comparatively slow rate of viral evolution, why are we having so many clinically important variants appear all of a sudden? Good. Two things. One, uh, I think this past winter is when the uh, pandemic became out of control. So yes, SARS-CoV-2 has a low evolutionary rate, but, you, but when you have tens, hundreds of millions of people becoming infected, you're giving that virus so many different rolls of the dice, right? In order to find a mutation that, that, that makes it work better, right? And I think it's the out of control infection in so many people that just gives this virus a better chance of mutating compared to other viruses um, out there. Um, in addition, you know, as I said, we've always had different variants, even earlier. Why are we paying attention to them now? Well, part of it is because we now can do something about, about um, SARS-CoV-2. We've got monoclonal antibodies, we've got vaccines. So now all of a sudden, these variants have real clinical impact in that they could affect the efficacy of the uh, vaccines or the efficacy of the monoclonal antibodies. Whereas before, if you found a new variant, all right, well, what are you going to do? You're just going to do the same things, right? You're going to mask and, and social distance. Well, now we've got, we've got treatments that, that can be effective. And so that's another reason why we're paying more um, attention to these uh, variants uh, now. So um, given Arizona results predominance of B1351 in sub-Saharan Africa, how can we recommend a rollout of AZ in a region with a clear conscience? Uh, so I'll give, I'm sorry, not Arizona. I think it's AZ. Um, and so how do we recommend? Well, don't forget, B1351 is still a minority of variants worldwide. It's a tiny proportion. Yes, it's predominantly uh, in South Africa, but even in other parts of Africa, B1351 is not that common. So yes, I agree with you that, that that's is one of the reasons that they're not really doing AstraZeneca in South Africa, but for the vast majority of the world, you've got 70% efficacy. And in places where they don't have another option, I think AstraZeneca is better than nothing, right? 70% efficacy against the majority of the variants, including B117 um, versus nothing. And, and especially in a region that doesn't have B1351, which is still predominantly, um, you know, it's in, in Southern Africa. So I think that's how, that, that's one of the reasons why people are still using it, right? So VIR7, there's a question about this new um, treatment, VIR7831. I think it looks pretty good. I think the resistance looks pretty good. I have to say, I haven't taken a deep dive into the data, uh, resistance data, but I think overall it looks, it looks pretty good. So I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, so, um, concern about the reduced efficacy of a vaccine against variants, especially B1351. If the, yeah, if, if your vaccine efficacy doesn't reach up to the lower, can it lead to emergence of more mutations? That great question. People are studying that right now. Uh, we're actually doing a study here where we're looking at vaccine breakthroughs to see what variants are, are infecting. Are there signs of mutations? Um, 
uh, you know, again, uh, those seems to be still seem to be somewhat rare right now. And patients who even where they have a breakthrough infection have very mild disease or asymptomatic disease. So, um, but something that everyone is keeping a close eye on right now. Um, okay, whether the different efficacy of vaccines against new variants are due to the different platforms of the vaccines. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I'm not sure about the answer to that. I think it's, it, it has to do with probably the extent of neutralizing antibody titers that are being um, induced uh, and overall immune responses. Some folks have also talked about T cell responses and uh, because, but and how well it induces T cell responses because T cells will react against other parts of the SARS-CoV-2 in addition to the spike and, and protect against Right, uh, protect against, um, and, and, and so spike mutations don't affect T cell responses, but really at this point, um, I think it's still not yet clear exactly why, why one vaccine works better against a variant and not, and not another one yet. Um, okay, so another question about AstraZeneca and low resource countries, again, it's the same answer. Um, you know, if you don't have another option, and again, 70% against almost all variants, except for B1351 and P1. And if B1351 is not in your region, then, then I, I think it's, you gotta do it. It's better than nothing, right? So that's something to, to consider with AstraZeneca. 70% against the majority of the variants around the world. It's still excellent. Um, unfortunately, we don't see a decrease in the numbers of cases in Brazil where we have the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Sinovac vaccine. We still have a small proportion of population vaccinated, but do you have any thoughts on efficacy of these two vaccines against P1? I think you know P1 has a lot of the same, the 484 and 417 mutations as as B1351. So I'm a little concerned about AstraZeneca. I really don't know much about the Sinovac vaccine um, and about its effect on on um, on variants. I haven't actually seen any data on Sinovac, um, in, you know, the vaccinated serum even on uh, in vitro studies. So I can't really comment on that, but I. I would be a little bit concerned about the AstraZeneca vaccine and its uh, efficacy in, against P1 as well. Should, um, uh, the next question, let's see here. <laughs> what was the correct answer to uh, post-test question number one? So the correct answer, sorry about that. Post-test question number one was that D614G is a um, is more transmissible, right? I showed in one of the slides that D614 G is more transmissible. I, I gave you. I, I'm a virologist by training, so so you can blame me. But but answer number three was a bit of a distractor when I said that um, the DNA uh, mutations can can lead to a change in spike. As I mentioned in the talk, the virus doesn't have a DNA. Uh, it's an RNA virus, so that, that that was my fault. So. Sorry about that. Um, it's, it's, it's me kind of geeking out a little bit on, on the virology, but it's a bit of a distractor. But the answer, as I mentioned in the talk, is D614G is, um, uh, is uh, um, the, 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 um, uh, more transmissible. Well, um, uh, let's see here, other questions. Um, online data source. So I have to say, I, I, uh, online data source, I use, um, I mean, I, 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 I use, I go to the New York Times. They actually update their, uh, their website pretty frequently. Um, for my viral genetics data, I look at NextStrain and GISAID. Um, and then there's an, oh, there's an outbreak.info or outbreak.org, but that also has um, some nice data sets as well for more, I don't know, maybe it's more for the scientists, but um, uh, any info resistance on monoclonal antibodies for vaccines with California, New York variant? Yes, I, I, I mentioned that the California variant has this L452R that um, will cause um, bamlanivimab to be less effective. That's why the um, DHHA, DHHS is restricting bamlanivimab um, um, in Arizona, Nevada, and California because of the rise of the California uh, variant. Uh, when mutation to less lethality be an advantage to the virus, maybe India? Um, yeah, possibly. Um, that's, you know, those, those variants, we're just not detecting, right? The ones that, that have mutations that make it less, oh, I'm sorry, the ones that make it less lethal. Yeah, it's possible. Um, and, uh, um, but yeah, uh, in some ways, maybe those are the ones that we're not as concerned about. I, I don't know. Um, placebo, uh, about the AstraZeneca vaccine, people appeared that the vaccinated group had a higher cumulative infection than placebo. Yeah, so that was an interim, um, 
analysis. And, and as I mentioned in that in the press release later on, they found that with more data that, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, that was that, sorry. I'm, I'm thinking of the other ones. So you're talking about higher cumulative infection than placebo. Can, oh, sorry. Can the vaccine produce deleterious infection? Uh, sorry, I was thinking of a different, uh, different question. Um, it's not clear. They haven't, they haven't released all the sequencing data for the AstraZeneca trial. Um, and and uh, there's been questions about who are the folks who broke through the AstraZeneca vaccine and um, what are the variants that, um, that broke through the vaccine? And right now we don't, we don't have that data yet, so unfortunately. Um, under what clinical circumstances should sequencing be done to aid in patient care? Unfortunately, um, sequencing is not commercially available right now. Um, sequencing is mostly done by academic centers and health departments um, for just for tracking the outbreaks. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we, I, yeah, and unfortunately, it's not available yet right now for, for commercial testing, for helping with me clinical management of individual of patients. Uh, maybe, I, I hope that'll change, or maybe that the fact that these uh, vaccines are coming along, maybe, I don't know, maybe we can avoid it, but um, hopefully the, the, the um, uh, anyway, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. Uh, there's a discussion that delaying the second vaccine dose could be another mechanism uh, to lead to worrisome mutations. Uh, is there a comment? I, I don't have a comment on that one. I, I, there's, I don't have any data on, um, unfortunately, on one dose versus two doses and what that means. Now, oh, there was a presentation at Croy, though, that if you had previously been infected with COVID, that one dose of vaccine uh, of Pfizer or Moderna will give you the same neutralizing antibody titers as two doses of, of uh, Moderna or Pfizer for someone who has not been infected before. So I thought that was actually quite interesting and supportive of one dose for someone who had previously been, been infected. Are you very confident of the reports of increased severity mortality of the B117 variant? Uh, I, you know, there's been a couple reports now. There's this, that one in BMJ. There's another paper that was just published in, I think it was Nature, that showed the same thing. <sighs> Am I confident in it? I think it's the best data we've got. Um, I, you know, I think we'll, we'll have to see whether that data can be replic replicated in other places as the B117 spreads. So, is the J and J variant similarly positioned to develop a booster shot if needed? Um, I don't. I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. Uh, what data is there, if any, suggesting that obese patients may have lower antibody response following coronavirus vaccination, and will that necessitate a booster or um, uh, you know, I have not seen any of that. I have not seen that data, actually, on whether um, they, at least in some of the, the results that have been released so far, I have not seen that it affects um, efficacy, that they have looked at obese patients and vaccine efficacy. Um, so I don't, I don't know about that one. How do we ramp up sequencing? Well, you know, I think that the fact that the current um, administration is putting more resources into that, not cheap, um, that uh, uh, I think just doing more surveillance and, and uh, more resources to this area is what's needed. And, and hopefully that's happening right now. So I know that the U.S. is ramping up our sequencing efforts. So I think that's been that's been good. Um, all right, maybe we'll just take a couple more questions um, before we end this. Do we know the efficacy of um, Moderna, Pfizer, and JJ in the Brazil um, again and the South African variants with risk uh, respect uh, respect to risk of severe disease and death? No, we don't at this point. Um, will there be a trend towards routine typing of variants in order to guide individualized therapy? Another good question. It's not offered commercially right now. I think it's possible. The main problem, right? So we're, we're used to, um, we're used to HIV, right? Where you can send off a resistance test and wait, you know, a week for it to come back, right? With COVID, you don't have the luxury of time. And that is one of the big problems with commercialization of sequencing, that you got to make a decision immediately, 
Are you going to treat this person with monoclonal antibodies or are you not? Um, because the earlier that you treat, the better. You can't wait a week. So I, I'm not totally sure that we're going to get to that point where we're, we're going to have a commercial test. Um, maybe we will, but um, the dynamics of treatment and the logistics of treatment is going to be different with COVID-19 or with um, with uh, um, or with HIV. So I'll just take this last question. Um, yes, um, in our isolated immunosuppressed patients, the 44K and the 501Y um, develop independently. And actually, if you look at B, uh, B117, B1351, you know, P1, for example, all of these variants, they're all very different, except for a few key mutations, right? So for B1351 and P1, the 484K, the 417 mutations, whereas all the other mutations are different. So what that means is that it's a sign of what's known as convergent evolution, where multiple mutation, where multiple different lineages are developing the same variants independent of each other. And that's just another sign that these mutations are very important uh, across multiple populations, continents, and really provide more evidence that, that they're ones that if we're gonna make a booster shot against, we should incorporate some of these mutations because they have been able to arise independently in multiple populations. So, all right, why don't we stop there? Um, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be here and being able a chance to, to answer all of your questions. And um, thanks for IAS USA for uh, hosting this. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Evaluations and information on how to claim continuing education credit will be emailed by 5 p.m. tomorrow Pacific time. And this will enable us to review all of those that have attended today's live broadcast. Information for upcoming webinars available for sign up is on the ISUSA website. And next week we will be having a webinar with Dr. Green regarding geriatric assessment for people with HIV. All upcoming webinars, again, are available on the ISUSA website for sign up. And here's a list of upcoming courses. We have a two day virtual course that will go over information from CROI. Part one will be on April 7th and the second part will be on April 14th. Again, other information will be available on the ISUSA website. And vir the virtual CROI 2021 abstract ebook is now available for public access. And you may access this through the croiconference.org website. Lastly, here is a list of our upcoming dialogue and recent on-demand dialogues regarding COVID-19. You may watch this through the IAS USA website. Again, we'd like to thank our presenter, Dr. Lee, the audience for your participation, and to all clinicians continuing to go above and beyond to serve their patients during the pandemic. This concludes today's webinar presentation.